So really, I'm talking really about overviewing the entire period, I suppose, now, tonight, but looking particularly at the revolutionary years, 1918 to 1921. But take the first slide, please, um, Pauline, thank you very much. <clears throat> And we can see coming up here, just reminding us, of course, that, I mean, if anybody, and I was, I'm, I'm involved in a conference in Monaco Museum, if anybody's interested, it's going to be on Zoom, and I think it's free, on Friday, looking at border minority communities and partition, and looking at people from all traditions, orange and green on both sides of the border, with local experts looking at it. And the one thing I always say is that if you'd stopped a person in the street in Enniskillen or Oma, or Ballina Mallard or Ballina in 1910 even, and said, you know, in 10 years time, Ireland's going to be divided. You'll be into a period of massive violence on this island, also on the world stage during the Great War. And this will be a very hard border, which will cut through parishes and um, farms and dwellings and villages and old administrative boundaries and railways, they would have thought you mad. They would have pointed to the all-Ireland regime that existed um, from uh, the Act of Union of 1800, where Dublin Castle managed the British administration of Ireland, where you had the Chief Secretary for Ireland in the Cabinet, you had an Under Secretary in Dublin Castle, you had a police force um, recruited from the whole island, um, and um, uh, trained in Dublin and sent to Tyrone, Fermanagh and elsewhere. The judges moved from Dublin. Uh, Fermanagh and Tyrone were part of the old Northwest Circuit of Ireland, which stretched from Athlone and County Westmeath to Mallon Head. The judges and the barristers would move from a size town to a size town um, at that time. And all of this is continuing down to 1920, 21. And you get some aberrations, for example, uh, exactly a hundred years ago, in um, November 1921, the Donegal courts were still meeting in the courthouse in Derry stroke Londonderry, even though a border was coming into effect. You'll still read in the paper, you know, Boncrana Court sitting in Derry um, and that kind of thing. Uh, and of course, uh, Enniskillen managed the, the poor law in large parts of Cabin and Leitrim. Straban had two consuls, one for the Tyrone side of the town, one for Donegal, Derry, London, Derry had two councils. London, Derry number one was the corporation for the city and London, Derry number two was for a large part of East and North Donegal. And you can imagine the Great Northern Railway System slicing through all this. I mean, all of this was going to be challenged in these years. So people were not prepared really um, a decade earlier in 1910, 1912. What changes everything, of course, is the re-emergence of the home rule question as a kind of burning issue um, at this time. And of course, the Home Rule Party founded by Parnell, uh, founded by Isaac Butt actually, um, a, an Ulster Protestant barrister and an Orangeman in 1870, became Parnell's party, the Irish Parliamentary Party in 1885, um, almost achieving home rule when Gladstone was persuaded to introduce um, a bill for self-government for the whole of Ireland. And of course, he would fail on two occasions. And it wasn't until long after the death of Parnell, following the O'Shea divorce scandal, that the Home Rule Party was reunited in 1900. Under the gentleman there, um, on the, I suppose, on the left of the lady, um, the third in that role, John Redmond. John Redmond was uh, Parnell's, if you like, um, loyal supporter. Like Carson, he was a barrister. He had a great admiration for the, the House of Commons. He had worked there as a clerk, helping to manage his business. He had worked with Carson in the four courts um, as a defence barrister. And he was the son of a nationalist MP, becoming the MP, of course, for um, Waterford himself. Now, John Redmond was a very modern Irish nationalist. I mean, he didn't want an independent Ireland. He wanted a united Ireland under the crown, but with a government in Dublin dealing with Irish affairs. That's what he wanted. And from 1900 on, the Home Rule Party revives across Ireland. Um, the small man, on Redmond's left is wee Joe Devlin, Joseph Devlin, born of Tyrone, um, uh, if you like, um, um, East Tyrone folk from Arbo in Belfast. He became, of course, the leading figure in Northern nationalism. 
from the early 20th century until his death in 1934. Um, like Carson, like Redmond, Devlin was a brilliant orator. He was nicknamed the Pocket Demosthenes. Demosthenes or Demosthenes was a Greek orator, a famous orator, and uh, he had that power of oratory in the House of Commons. He also reorganised the Catholics of Ulster into the Home Rule Party. And he did that primarily by reviving the sort of shadowy, secretive, ancient order of Hibernians. The AOH dated way back to the defenders at the end of the 18th century, the defenders who came to close quarters with the Orange Society at that time. And by the late 19th century, Hibernianism was reduced to a kind of a rural fringe condemned by the Catholic Church and its bishops. Um, like the Orange Order, it had been kind of banished to the shadows by the middle of the 19th century, but Home Rule would change all of that. And just as Orangeism was reviving across Ulster from Belfast to Donegal, so <clears throat> in fact, um, Hibernianism became strong. There were something like 60 divisions in Tyrone. This was a kind of not just like the Orange Order, it acted as a kind of a poor man's university, a social club, a political religious pressure uh, group. Like Orangeism, it was aligned to the Catholic Church, but not part of it. So it claimed to be Catholic, but was outside the control of the church, which is something that Cardinal Logue, for example, the head of the Catholic Church until 1924, um, disliked and he condemned Hibernianism um, in Carrick Moor in County Tyrone in 1908 as a tyranny, a cruel pest in their midst. But other bishops like um, O'Donnell of Raffaux um, actually um, not only um, approved of Hibernianism, but helped to promote it. And by 1914, the Hibernians were 100,000 strong in Ireland, to Orangisms, probably 100,000 strong as well. So the Home Rule Party, by 1912, is reunited. Um, they take their seats in the House of Commons, um, criticised by very few, criticised by the um, what's seen as the lunatic fringe, of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, the IRB, um, which was heavily supported from Irish America, but had limited support in Ireland. And of course, criticized also by the, the left-wing uh, kind of nationalist people like James Connolly, um, who argued that, of course, home rule was not true independence. Arthur Griffith, of course, um, a Dublin-born journalist who spent some time in South Africa, he had founded a, a kind of a counterparty in 1905 which he called Sinn Féin. And Sinn Féin meant, didn't mean ourselves alone, which is what most school children will tell you. It meant really self-reliance, standing on your own feet. <clears throat> and that's the movement that Griffith founded. Um, it won a few seats in Dublin Corporation, but it failed to make a major impact. And by 1912, the eyes of nationalist Ireland and indeed the Irish world, because you had the, the Irish diaspora from Canada to America, to Australia, to South Africa, was focused on Ireland. Would Ireland become a dominion like Canada, for example? That was a question in the minds of Irish men and women across the world. Um, now, the opportunity came, of course, for the nationalists in 1910, because in that year, um, you had a hung parliament in the United Kingdom. The Liberals lost their massive majority from the election of 1905 and Asquith, the uh, Liberal Prime Minister, was scrambling about trying to cobble together a government. We've seen that with Gordon Brown in um, uh, 2010. We've seen that um, with um, Theresa May uh, in 2017 when she turned to, to the DUP. In this case, Asquith, a very astute prime minister, not very interested in Ireland, more interested in radical reform. This was the party, of course, the Liberals of innovative reform, the party of old age pensions, the party of education acts. Um, uh, uh, Asquith wanted nationalist votes to stay apart. The price, of course, as demanded by John Redmond, was home rule for all Ireland. So we were back to 1886. And of course, um, with the votes of the 80 or so nationalists, the uh, 40 Liberal MPs, and of course the Liberals who had half the House of Commons, home rule seemed assured by 1914. And this was 
uh, especially so because the Liberal government had removed the power of the House of Lords. The House of Lords had blocked home rule indefinitely, but now they could only delay it for two years. So to the resentment of the Conservatives who dominate, historically dominated the Lords, they were now going to have to, if you like, swallow the bitter pill of home rule. Now, of course, this, of course, was to galvanise British Conservatives and Ulster Unionists in opposition to Home Rule. The next slide, please, uh, Pauline. Um, so as nationalism seems to be in the driving seat, we turn to the north of Ireland, as everybody called it then. Ulster wasn't used a lot. The newsletter ran a feature every year from about 1900. Industries of the north of Ireland, linen, shipbuilding, engineering. And a man who was sprung from that background was the gentleman on the right. This is James Craig known for most of his early political career as Captain James Craig. Craig was born in 1871 in East Belfast. He was the son of a wealthy distiller, a man who'd driven from the, from the shop floor as a commercial traveller, selling Irish whiskey in the west of Ireland, suddenly became chairman of the board of Dunville's um, Royal Irish Distillery. Unusual for a Presbyterian. Um, and of course, James Craig, who inherited £100,000 at the age of 21, um, served, he was educated in Edinburgh. Uh, he served in the Boer War with distinction, became a captain in the Royal Irish Rifles, and he showed a great flair for organisation. He wasn't a great public speaker. In fact, the historian of Ulster, Jonathan Barton, has described James Craig as being, quote, signally uncharismatic. I hear you saying that hasn't mm. stopped many of our local politicians over the years. Nonetheless, James Craig didn't have that ready, if you like, turn of phrase that electrified audiences. And he knew this was his weakness. His great strength was, of course, becoming an MP in 1906. Um, he became a Conservative and Unionist member for mid dawn But of course, the problem was he had previously stood in North Fermanagh in 1903, and he had realised some of the problems facing the Unionists of Ulster at that time, because Craig was defeated um, in North Fermanagh, Ballinam Allard, Tempo, um, and that area, by a land reform candidate. Um, and this, um, this came as a great shock to him when Mitchell, the land reformer, won with the support of local Methodists and local Catholics. Craig realised that there was a danger that if he didn't somehow um, restore the unity of Ulster Protestantism, which was beginning to show signs of falling apart over issues like land and harsh working conditions in Belfast, then unionism was doomed. Um, and so... Um, he realised he would have to do two things. He would have to cement the alliance with the Conservative Party going back to 1886, and he would have to ensure the revival of the Orange Order and the Orange Lodges rivaling the Hibernians and Nationalist Ireland became, if you like, the social cement of unionism because they transcended uh, class and creed. Every Protestant denomination was reflected, of course, in Orangism. Craig became an Orange man. He toured the nine counties of Ulster, and he realised there was another weakness of Unionism in the early 20th century, in what we call the Edwardian years. And that was the stranglehold, the dead hand, if you like, of the landed gentry of the big house. And in 1906, Craig with others, attended the funeral of Colonel Edward Saunderson in County Cavan. Saunderson had been the founder of the so-called Irish Unionist Party in the House of Commons. He was a Cavan landlord. Um, he had been a liberal, but then he had converted to unionism with home rule. And when Craig helped to bury Saunderson in Cavan soil in 1906, as he took the train back from Belturbet to Belfast, he realised that here was an opportunity for young men like him from the upper middle classes with a business and professional background to seize control of the Unionist Party. The gentry would have their place, but they would no longer be dominant. And so Craig and his brother Charles and a group of Unionist lawyers, they took over the party and they called their movement the Ulster Unionist Council. And this is the division of unionism north-south. In the south you had the Irish Unionist Alliance, mainly landed, aristocratic, 
Church of Ireland. In the north, you had the, 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 the bridge between Presbyterianism and Episcopalianism in terms of um, the Ulster Unionist Council. Now, I said Craig realised his weakness. By 1910, home rule seemed inevitable. So he decided to do something dramatic as well. He realised the best Irish spokesman on the floor of the House of Commons was, of course, Sir Edward Carson. Carson, uh, a southerner, uh, an Irish unionist above all else, not an orange man, a man of the south, the lawyer with the Dublin accent, a very eminent um, advocate, uh, first of all in the four courts and then of course in the old Bailey. Carson became an English uh, king's counsel, was earning massive fees, but of course as a young man he had learnt with his mother's milk the essentials of Irish unionism. And that's another thing about Carson. He was an older man, 20 years older than Craig almost. He was born in Dublin in 1854. But of course, um, he was the son of a modest architect from Dublin. The family were originally Scottish a few generations before. But it was from his mother, um, Isabella Lambert from County Galway, that Carson derived his political, if you like, ideals. Uh, his mother was one of the Lamberts who were from William soldiers settled at Athen Rye in County Galway. I, I drove through Athen Rye the other day and I was telling my wife about Carson because it was in the big house there at Castle Ellen, County Galway, that the young Ned Carson, who's always known as Ned in the family, um, mixed with the local people and he discovered that they spoke the Irish language, they played hurling. He would play a similar game, hurling a bit like the Scottish Shinty at Trinity College later. So he was a man who knew the South, but he didn't know the North. He'd been to Belfast once. As a young man, he wasn't terribly impressed by it. He married um, beneath himself, people would have said. He married a policeman's daughter, but she was also from County Galway, and that Kerwin. So this Galway connection was very strong in the Carson family. Um, not only that, of course, um, he made it clear very early on where his allegiance lay. He told a deputation who wanted him to stand, this young, able barrister, as a nationalist candidate in County Waterford in the 1880s. He said, I can't, gentlemen. The union is my guiding star. So this man, a young man known as Bones, he was such a tall, um, gangling kind of fellow uh, with a large, jutting jaw, a brilliant voice, um, with the um, uh, honey tones of the South, um, he wanted to become a barrister. Uh, he was educated at Port Arlington in the centre of Ireland, the Church of Ireland School. Uh, he went to Trinity College. Uh, he became a, went to the Irish Bar. Um, and it was the Chief Secretary for Ireland, who later became British Prime Minister, Arthur Balfour, who, who realised Carson's mettle and appointed him a Crown Prosecutor during the Land War. So Carson was prosecuting nationalists like John Dillon, for example, for agrarian offences during that period. He then became the Conservative MP for Trinity College, his old university. He would remain a Dublin MP for most of his career. He only broke that connection on the eve of partition, moving north later on. And of course, he soon became the uh, unionist Irish spokesman of the House of Commons, blending politics with the bar. Remember, MPs were not paid until 1911. You had to be wealthy to become an MP, um, which is why I never became one. <laughs> but anyway, there you are. So uh, Carson is critical to Craig's plan because Carson wanted to do something. He wanted to save the whole of Ireland in the folds of the Union Jack. That suited Craig the status quo, Dublin Castle, the crown. However, what if that fails? Carson would be a perfect, if you like, front of house man. Um, he mightn't get the, 20, the, the, the 32 counties, but he could argue perhaps for the nine counties of the six, um, getting the best deal he could for his Ulster Unionist clients. Craig had a dream in 1906 when he went into politics. And that dream was to create a homeland for his own people, the Ulster Protestants, mainly of Scottish Presbyterian stock, in the land of the shipyard and the linen trade. Would that extend over the whole province? 
no one was sure. So these men are critical. Somebody once wrote, the historian Patrick Buckland, that together they became another invincible personality. And of course, behind them stood the Conservative Party in the form of Andrew Bono Law. Bono Law was not only the Conservative leader, but he was a man of strong Ulster Protestant stock. His father was a Presbyterian minister from Coleraine. And throughout this whole period, down to 1922, Law used his influence in favour of the Ulster Unionists to get them the best deal possible as the Irish question was being settled. The next page, the next slide, please. Oops. And here we have, of course, I think we've maybe jumped one. So we're going back a couple there, please, Pauline. I think we've just jumped a couple. No, we're moving forward. We need to move, we need to move back um, about three. One more. Great stuff. Just, uh, uh, just one more. That's it. Perfect. Um, and, of course, um, among the tactics adopted by Craig and Carson to frustrate home rule was not just the signing of the semi-religious covenant, which threatened to invoke the use of force against an Irish parliament. Now, this is extreme language. I mean, here you have um, Crown loyalists threatening to use violence against the forces of the Crown if the King in Parliament decrees home rule for Ireland. Think about that. Um, this is very important when you consider that Parliament, then as now, is an alternative to civil war. And somehow when, when, when Parliament at Westminster is disrupted, as it was two or three years ago during the Brexit debate, you know, uh, people had a sinking feeling that, I mean, if Parliament's in uproar and it's being suspended and all sorts of tactics are being used, you could have the end of democracy. And therefore, uh, Parliament is an alternative to civil war. Um, but in these years, the opposition and the government, the Liberal government, the Tory unionist opposition, are really at daggers drawn. The rhetoric is extreme. Threats are being made. And outside, of course, violence, the threat of violence is being condoned. And the most important event was the formation of the Ulster Volunteer Force in January 1913, a form that became 90,000 strong, men from the shipyards, farmhands, officered by the gentry and the middle classes, people like the Duke of Abercorn, people like um, uh, Sir Basil Brooke on his Fermanagh estate, people like Lord Londonderry and North Don. They are the leaders of the UVM. They have powerful support from the Conservative Party and Bona Law. And several leading Conservatives who become cabinet ministers like Lord Birkenhead, a Liverpool Orange MP, actually become members of the UVM and review them with Edward Carson. But the real a challenge comes in April 1914, on the very eve of the Great War, which has been building up in the background. The uh, Major Fred Crawford, a Belfast businessman, leading unionist, with Carson's consent, ran 35,000 German guns into the port of Lyon, and that included several hundred machine guns. So we have the UVF kind of, if you like, strutting their stuff here at Germanus outside Lyon in 1914. Now, Ireland watches this, the whole island of Ireland watches this, and they see two things happening. They see, first of all, the rise of a militant private army in the north, which says it will use force as ordained by Carson to oppose home rule. And it sees the British Parliament in uproar. Um, and the result of that, of course, is to inspire a nationalist idea. Where the North had gone, the South would follow, and they would form their own rival volunteer force. And this happened six months after the UVF. Let's see the next slide, please. It was the historian, of course, Michael Laffin, looking at the next slide, coming up. Thank you very much. Uh, and here we have the Irish volunteers. We've chosen West Belfast to give you a sense of this. The men in the top hats are professional men. They're mainly doctors and lawyers. Um, wealthy publicans, the Catholic middle class, which was very small um, in Ulster until, in fact, in Northern Ireland, until the 1947 Education Act. Only something like 9% um, of Catholics were middle class until the 1950s. And that's very small compared to other communities. And there are historical reasons for that we can discuss. But here are the Irish volunteers being reviewed on the false road. Now, of course, um, John Redmond has a dilemma. The Irish Volunteers were formed by Owen McNeill. Owen McNeill 
was from the lens of Antrim. He was a history professor in Dublin. He was the co-founder of the Gaelic League to revive Irish as a spoken language. And he had praised the UVF in an article in a Gaelic League journal. He had said in Clive Sullish, The Sword of Light in 1913, praising Carson, he said, the North has begun. And he quoted an old Young Ireland poem, the North began, the North held on, God bless the Northern land. The IRB in the shadows, people like old Tom Clark from Dungannon, people like Bulmer Hobson, people like Sean McDermott, Sean McDermott, who had been working as a bus conductor, a tram conductor in Belfast, they approached McNeil and said, look, you're a respectable professional man. People will look up to you. They don't trust us. Call a meeting and form the Irish Volunteers. And from Antrim to Cork, to Rome, from Anna, the Volunteers were formed. Soon you'll have something like um, six, seven thousand Irish Volunteers in Tyrone. You have something like five thousand in Fermanagh. Part of this two hundred thousand across the island of Ireland. They're drilling, they're training, and they're out to defend home rule. Now, of course, you can imagine what might happen in the, uh, the square in Oma or, you know, the square in Dungannon. What happens if the UVF with their rifles come into close quarters with the Irish volunteers? Um, an accidental discharge, you could have red civil war um, in Ulster in these years. So, I mean, several things are happening, but from the point of view of asked with the prime minister, he suddenly finds that her, her, his majesty's loyal opposition is less interested in being a loyal opposition and more interested in using the Irish question to return to power. Because for Bono Law and the Conservatives, this idea of Protestants in danger in Ireland, in danger from Rome rule, and of course the empire in danger of Ireland gets a large measure of independence, they are burning issues, uh, which of course divide the British public. And of course, make it very difficult for Asquith to make progress. He begins to think of concessions. The next slide, please. And Churchill begins to read, uh, write about the dreary steeples of Fermanagh and Tyrone in these years. He knew them well from his childhood holidays with his cousins, the Leslies of Castle Leslie and County Monaghan. Churchill visited all these big houses, Castle Cool, Castle Saunderson, Castle Archdale. He knew them all. And uh, he knew the dreary steeples of Fermanagh and Tyrone that he would immortalise after the Great War. But of course, events, dear boy, events, said Harold Macmillan um, 40 years later. Two things happen. Ireland's on the brink of civil war by um, the summer of 1914. Um, the king calls a conference at Buckingham Palace to restore peace. The conference fails to agree on which parts of the north of Ireland will be excluded from Home Rule. And it falls down on the issue of Fermanagh and Tyrone. Churchill says it becomes bogged down in the muddy byways of Fermanagh and Tyrone. We keep getting the impression it rains a lot. As a former resident of Fermanagh, I have to say that was my experience in the 1980s anyway. Nonetheless, um, these events, of course, attempts to find a compromise. County option fail completely. The two sides are too far apart, Carson and Redmond. Behind the scenes, both men want to avoid civil war. But, you know, Carson in particular is making very, very strong statements during this period. Don't be afraid of illegalities, he tells a meeting in Newry uh, in 1913. Everything I ask you to do is illegal. Now, one could forget for a moment that Carson was a former Solicitor General for Ireland and a future Attorney General for the United Kingdom. Nonetheless, of course, the Great War intervenes. Those alliance systems that are building up Germany and her allies, the Entente involving Britain, France and Russia, um, the invasion of Belgium in 1914, and suddenly Britain and Ireland are at war with Germany. And of course, Carson and Redmond turn to their rival armies and urge them to go into the British war effort. Redmond uses the famous phrases, phrase, they must go wherever the firing line extends. Carson calls on his men to fight for Ulster and the Empire. Same uniform, same Union Jack, but different aspirations for the nationalists and unionists of Fermanagh and Tyrone and elsewhere during this entire period. 200,000 Irishmen join up 
to both traditions, about 40,000 will never return from events like the Battle of the Somme and the Battle of Messine. And it's in the middle of this great war that that small minority group the Irish Republican Brotherhood, who had been carefully monitored by the RIC, who followed suspect Hobson and suspect Clark around in their um, journeys around Ireland, suddenly they um, obtain an ally in Sir Roger Casement, a former British consul, the author of the first human rights report, Casement from a, a big house Protestant background in North Antrim, and very early on shows nationalist um, tendencies, um, conceals those until he retires from the diplomatic service with a knighthood, which he isn't terribly interested in. And Casement, of course, becomes initially a home ruler, and more and more he becomes a separatist, wanting Irish independence. He offers his services to the IRB, and he sends on a mission from neutral America to Germany to obtain arms and men for a rising. The IRB's slogan is that of the old Fenian movement, England's difficulty is Ireland's opportunity. And that results, of course, in that bolt from the blue, the Easter Rising in um, April, May 1916. Um, and of course, the Rising is largely confined to Dublin, attempts to mobilise the Northern volunteers at Coal Island and County Tyrone, um, fail because Owen McNeil, who's on the moderate wing of the um, Irish volunteers, tries to stop the Rising. Um, by contramanding the order for mobilization on Easter Sunday. And McNeil, of course, believed that the rising will be suicidal. He's been kept in the dark by the hard men of the IRB. Um, they wanted an all island revolt. The volunteers are sent home from Tyrone. Dr. Patrick McCartan in the mountains of Tyrone is hiding out. And he writes a long letter, which we now have, to his, uh, his friend and fellow Tyrone Republican, Joe McGarrity a very wealthy liquor um, uh, businessman in uh, Philadelphia. And from the fields of Tyrone in May 1916, uh, hiding out, uh, Dr. Patrick McCartan, a dispensary doctor writes, we have failed in Tyrone, but it's not the fault of Tyrone, it's the fault of Dublin. In other words, Dublin mucked up the rising in the north. Interesting point there though, what if the rising had gone ahead in Tyrone, or if the men who were told to march into the west of Ireland were fired on by the police, resisted? Where would that have left Tyrone, and therefore Fermanagh, um, in the subsequent debate around the partition of Ireland? If red blood had flowed in Tyrone, would that have cemented uh, Tyrone's place, as it were, um, with the rest of Ireland afterwards? It's worth thinking about that. In the end, no shot was fired in Ulster in James Connolly's words, and the rising was a Dublin affair. Um, about 500 people died, mostly civilian, 130 British casualties at the hands of Eamon de Valera's um, garrison at Boland's Mill. Then the surrender of Patrick Pierce, uh, the titular leader of the rising, a poet and schoolmaster, uh, and then the executions of Pierce, Connolly, Kant, McDermott, Connolly in the end who was a, a socialist as much as a Republican, was tied to a chair because he was dying from gangrene, having been wounded. And that became an eternal image for Republicanism then and then the generations after that. You know, they told me how Connolly was strapped to the chair, became a kind of a rebel song. Now that of course was to change public opinion completely. Um, uh, the government eventually stopped the executions. 90 had been condemned, condemned to death. Only 15 were executed. Um, if this was considered a modest amount, the main ringleaders, it didn't work out that way. Lady Fingal, an aristocrat, wrote in her diary, it was like watching blood flowing from, a clo from under a closed door. Public opinion began to change. Redmond and his, uh, his, his, his leadership, became questioned. They had failed to prevent the talk about partition. They had failed to secure home rule. Yes, it was on the statute book by 1914, but it was suspended for the duration of the war with the dark shadow of partition looming over an Irish parliament. People were becoming disillusioned. Martial law applied to the whole of Ireland. The manse, for example, um, at um, um, uh, Knockmoyle outside no, uh, 
Oma, the parochial house, I should say, at Mark Knockmoyle, was searched by troops to the anger of Father McKenna, the local parish priest, who later became a leading Sinn Féin uh, uh, personality in County Tyrone. We could see this all working out. What happened on the on the loyalist side? The UVF, of course, were called out during the Rising as a kind of an auxiliary defence force, defending railway stations, adding defensive police barracks, just in case there was a Rising in Ulster. Um, something else happens, of course, uh, just after this. But by this stage, 3,000 prisoners have been sent to Frongok in North Wales and other prisons. They include the unknown Edward de Valera, mathematics teacher born in New York to a Spanish-Cuban father and an Irish mother, and the young Michael Collins, who had been working in a bank in London for 10 years, originally from West Cork, who had joined all the key organisations from the Gaelic League to the IRB to the Irish Volunteers. For Michael Collins, looking back at the flaming ruins of the GPO, 1916 had been a disaster. He told his IRB colleagues in North Wales in the internment camp at Frongok, the next rebellion will be a guerrilla war on our terms. Now, of course, the next slide, please. Now, just as this is happening, uh, you have the second blood sacrifice on the Western Front. 5,000 Ulster Division casualties on the first day as men of the Ulster Division from the old UVF go into action at the Battle of the Somme. And of course, Carson makes a speech in July 1916, re, you know, which becomes his mantra. And he says, Home Rule was killed and buried on the battlefield of the Somme. Um, now, of course, Ireland is under a political truce. Until the rising, nationalists and unionists had by and large supported the war effort. For example, on the Falls Road and the Shankill Road, there were branches of Queen Mary Guild. In North and South Fermanagh, there were branches of the Queen Mary Guild when ladies from local churches, uh, mainly middle class, large farmers, wives or doctor's wives, were actually knitting socks and sending comforts to the local troops of the Western Front. And it seemed that Ireland was united as never before until the rising occurs. But of course, this had been a ticking bomb. De Valera, of course, was spared, not because of his American citizenship, but because he was too far down the list. He becomes president of a new Sinn Féin movement. He's released in 1917 with most of the leaders. And of course, he's elected as the MP for Clare. Sinn Féin refused to take their seats. They demand an Irish Republic. And de Valera campaigns in his Irish volunteer uniform, stained with the grime and suit of the GPO. And there is a new slogan. Soldiers are we whose lives are pledged to Ireland. These are the first lines of Oran de Vane, the soldier song, which had been written by Brendan Behan's uncle, Padre Kearney, to mark the rising. And of course, um, another ballad of the period was the Foggy Jew, written by a County Down parish priest, um, Father, pa Father um, um, Charles O'Neill, as he left an early meeting of the Doyle in Dublin, and he wrote that famous anthem of Easter week. What you're seeing here is the transfer of allegiance of a large part of nationalist Ireland from moderate home rule to revolutionary Sinn Féin. In the north, the nationalists are divided, though, between the Hibernian home rulers and the new Republicans. And that's reflected in Fermanagh and Oma. In Fermanagh, for example, the Sinn Féin leader Cahar Healy, a local journalist, becomes prominent. In Tyrone, it's a group of local solicitors led by George Murnaghan, um, whose family had always been at loggerheads with the Home Rule Party. They were nicknamed the Murnaghan Gang. I hope there are none in the room. <laughs> but those are the words of John Dillon. A home rule leader. The next slide, please. And all of this leads inevitably towards the 1918 general election. The one major blunder Redmond made after the rising was to negotiate with Carson on the basis of excluding six counties, the present six counties of Northern Ireland, from home rule. Redmond said it was temporary. Carson was given an assurance that it could be permanent. The nationalists voted for it, but it split nationalism, and then the whole scheme collapsed. And it meant that Redmond was now being blamed for partition. Partition hadn't occurred. But then we have to ask another question. Suppose in 1916, after the rising, 
Redmond and Carson had cut that deal that Lord George brokered, the so-called Home Rule negotiations of June 1916. And you had Home Rule for the South and the North administered as part of the United Kingdom directly from London. A very soft border, though, because the British Army was still in both parts of Ireland. You still had the Viceroy. You still had the RIC. Would Ireland have emerged differently? Would Ireland have avoided the violence around partition and the violence of the War of Independence? We'll never know that, but for a moment in 1916, it looked as though a compromise seemed possible, though not one that everyone agreed with. The Southern Unionists cried foul. Carson was abandoning them to their fate under the green flag. In the North, the Northern Nationalists, or many of them, especially those west of the band, complained that they were being thrown to the wolves by Redmond. In their case, the Unionist wolves led by Carson. And of course, the 1918 election confirms a Sinn Féin landslide in the South, based on a Republican platform, a demand for abstention from Westminster, the Hall of the Conqueror, de Valera declared. In the North, though, the vote had been extended to women over the age of 30, mainly middle class ladies, it must be said. Um, not only that, but Belfast was given a large number of extra seats, and Carson migrated North to become the MP for Duncan in North Belfast. He's more or less accepting the inevitability of partition, something he never wanted, something that would damn his own people in the South, something he would lament to his dying day. And of course, um, Owen McNeill is elected MP for Derry as he becomes Chuck the Dollar, a member of the Doyle. Because one other aspect of this was Sinn Féin declared in his manifesto two things. They would put Ireland's case for independence to the peace conference at Versailles, where small nations of Europe were meeting under the big three, Britain, France and America. Secondly, they would set up a parliament and government in Ireland called Doyle Ireland, the Assembly of Ireland. The next slide, please. The first Doyle meets, at least 27 of the TDs, it declares a republic, something that Ernest Blythe, uh, one of the few Protestants in the Doyle, a northern Protestant from Lisburn, he resented this. He was in jail in Belfast and he said that to declare republic was disastrous. The real problem was Irish unity. And he was a member of the Church of Ireland from Mahalogal in County Antrim, who would rise to become uh, a minister of the Irish Free State. So this is what happens. Later, de Valera is released, Collins is released, and a government is appointed with de Valera as president. The next slide, please. But of course, on the same day as the Doyle meets, the War of Independence breaks out. Uh, at a crossroads in County Tipperary, two uh, policemen are shot dead by the Irish volunteers. Nobody had ordered these killings. One Sinn Féin TD was so angry, he resigned. The church condemned them. But as the violence escalated and the British sent in the ex-soldiers, the Black and Towns and the auxiliaries and uh, the IRA uh, attacks on the police and military and indeed British intelligence were um, matched by a reprisal policy condoned by the British government against, first of all, property and then individuals. Um, then the church generally takes the view of the Catholic church and that it's a plague on both your houses. And of course, within Catholicism, the younger clergy coming out of Maynooth are more inclined to be Sinn Féin priests. The older clergy and the bishops tend to be Redmondite. And there is that rift. The older generation tend to be uh, home rulers, but they are fading fast. You know, you have the same kind of demographic change then as you have in Northern Ireland today. The older generation with its politics beginning to disappear at a time of major change caused today by Brexit, caused then, of course, by the Irish struggle for independence. And one victim of that two and a half year struggle for Irish independence, in which perhaps 5,000 died, was Alan Lendrum, a resident magistrate from Trillick in County Tyrone, from a strong farming family um, who was executed, murdered by the IRA in County Clare, as his body returns to be buried in Kilskeary in County Fermanagh uh, with a guard of honour from the Royal Inniskillings, um, sectarian tensions begin to rise um, in Tyrone and Fermanagh at this time. Next slide, please. 
And of course, it's really in Belfast. Belfast becomes the fulcrum of the long history of sectarian rioting, of violence in this period. The summer of 1920s see, for example, events in the South impacting on the situation in the North. Um, and of course, uh, uh, there's this massive uncertainty. And as we know, those of us who lived through the troubles and remember years like 1972 and 1985, um, we know that, um, you know, uncertainty breeds violence and breeds reprisals and breeds horrendous acts. And that's what begins to happen in the summer of 1920. A number of things happen. Um, a leading um, northern born RIC officer is um, assassinated by the IRA in Cork, General G.B. Smith of Banbridge. As his funeral moves north, um, tensions rise. There's trouble in Banbridge. There's later trouble that summer in Lisburn, uh, where the Catholic businesses in both towns are destroyed and people driven from their homes. And then in Belfast in July 1920, Carson makes his last appearance at the 12th field. Now, Sinn Féin have done very well in the local elections in the north, all, all over Ireland, um, because anti partitionists win three important councils in Ulster. One is uh, the old London Dairy Corporation, Dairy Council, if you like, um, where for the first time there is a nationalist majority and a nationalist mayor condemning partition, really moved towards it. In Fermanagh and Tyrone, anti-unionist councils are, are um, elected with Sinn Féin and the nationalists sharing power. Um, and of course, this is a major problem for people like James Craig, who were looking forward to achieving the clean cut of the six counties at this time. As men return to the shipyard, violence breaks out in Derry. There's a serious civil warfare war there. These, these, these election successes on the nationalist side are sustained by the introduction of PR, which is seen as a minority safeguard for Protestants in the South, the Catholics in the North. The result is, of course, um, 40 people die violently in Derry and shocking sectarian violence involving the UVF and the Irish Volunteers, soon to be renamed the IRA. Um, and that violence spreads to Belfast. Uh, 3,000 Catholics in the shipyard are driven from their jobs, as are perhaps 500 Protestant liberals, um, known as rotten probs. This extends to engineering works, other factories. Soon, uh, eight or 9,000 Catholics from the Ligon to the van are driven out of their work. Um, there's pressure on the Doyle from Northern nationalists to respond to this. They introduce a boycott of Belfast goods enforced by the IRA. Trains are stopped, goods are destroyed. Uh, Belfast businesses suddenly, who deal with the South and West in things like matches, soap, bread, provisions, grain, flour, um, um, everything else are being, black, uh, if you like, black blacklisted. And this applies a normal. And of course, violence begins to, the IRA campaign begins to extend northwards in the summer of 1920. You have the first attacks in barracks in Fermanagh in Tyrone. You have a Protestant distrust of the RIC, a mainly Catholic force. Um, you have James Craig taking steps to achieve his own homeland. Just a grim picture from Belfast in these years. Curfew applies. And for two years, Belfast becomes a war zone. Churchill calls it cannibalism, except the perpetrators do not devour the flesh of their victims. Uh, 450 people die in two years. 60% almost of those are from the Catholic minority community. Um, and of course, that uh, is, is explained by the fact that they tended to be in a couple of isolated areas and the arms are very much the, the um, propensity of, of, of guns tend to be uh, by 1920 on the loyalist side. The next slide, please. James Craig. This is his moment. Carson uh, is a declining force by 1920. He's a, a Belfast MP. He's all a lifelong hypochondriac. He's pleading age and infirmity. Uh, he's in his mid-60s. He wants to retire to the House of Lords and become a law lord. Um, and uh, there's a handover going on behind the scenes of power from the Dublin lawyer to the Belfast businessman, James Craig. Craig, of course, has his own very definite ideas of how to achieve his homeland. In the 1918 election manifesto, signed by Lord George, the Liberal, and Bono Law, the Tory, creating a new coalition government. Lord George had been Prime Minister, a member of a coalition since 1916. Uh, they had the, 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 the two leaders promised that in any Irish settlement, the six counties 
would not be forced under a Dublin Parliament against their will. And that allowed Craig and several members of his party to become junior ministers at Westminster. He became secretary to the minister to the Admiralty in 1920. Sir Dennis Henry, a Catholic lawyer from South Derry, um, became Attorney General for Ireland, later Lord Chief Justice uh, in Belfast. Uh, he was an unusual man from a, a, a wealthy Catholic background in Drekostan. Um, and, uh, um, you know, um, his, his father, James Henry, a wealthy landowner, had married the doctor's daughter, Ellen Kelly. They sent Dennis Henry to an English public school where he developed very much a conservative out outlook, became a leading lawyer in Dublin, and then, of course, declared his unionist credentials quite early on. So he's an unusual figure, Dennis Henry. James Craig, of course, um, is using his privileged position on the fringes of the British cabinet to achieve the best deal he can for his own people, the Ulster Protestants. We'll see the next slide, please. In October 1919, the British government, still involved in the peace conference, redrawing the map of Europe, uh, appoints Walter Long, uh, a leading conservative minister with some Irish experience, to chair a committee on Ireland. What will they do about Ireland? There's pressure from America, um, pressure from France, pressure from the liberal press in Britain. You have to stop this bloody war in Ireland. Um, uh, uh, 10 million people had died in the Great War. So there's no appetite among the British working class public or indeed upper classes to have a bloody little war going on, a kind of an Irish Vietnam. Although, of course, we haven't got to that stage at, the, at this point. So Walter Long um, is chairing a committee of liberals and Tories who had once been divided about Ireland. They decided that the solution lay in partition. There would be two Irish parliaments, north and south, with limited powers over education, over law and order. Uh, there would be a bond of union, a limited council of Ireland in charge of railways and fisheries, things that crisscross the new line that would harden into a frontier within a couple of years. And nobody saw a partition as permanent, by the way, except I think James Craig and his uh, entourage, they saw this as the permanent solution, which would exclude Dublin influence from um, Northern affairs. I think no doubt about that. Um, the only people really consulted about partition were the Ulster Unionists. They were consulted at every stage. They were very lucky that they were the largest Irish party. The Nationalists were reduced to six under Joe Devlin. Um, they, could, they were a party of protest, but they couldn't influence uh, public opinion, though they were backed by Asquith from the back benches by the Labour Party in these years, condemning the black and tans, the reprisal policy, and of course partition. The other thing was the committee had to decide what size would the new Northern Ireland be. They favoured nine counties, the old province. Let's think about that. Uh, you people in Fermanagh and Tyrone know Donegal well. And it had been just one entity at that, that stage. Pettigall was divided uh, between Donegal and Fermanagh, you know. Uh, Straban had two councils, one for Donegal. Derry had two councils, one for Donegal. Um, that was the norm. Several, um, uh, the area around Balik and Garrison, they were part of Ballyshan, an urban district, um, for uh, representation purposes. The... Uh, um, nobody talked about Fermanagh and Tyrone until 1914. It was Tyrone and Monaghan. That was the legal unit following the Diocese of Clara. There were all sorts of aberrations. And so the Long Committee recommended nine counties, which would give the Nationalists something like 44% of the population. It was too large a majority to inspire unionist confidence. The man who changed all this was James Craig. We read the minutes of Long's committee that on the um, uh, 13th of November 1919, Craig approached the committee and said um, he was opposed to nine counties. He thought that, uh, he said, uh, six counties preferable. And I quote what Craig said. Now, Craig is soon to be Prime Minister of Northern Ireland. The reason given was that, quote, Protestant representation would be strengthened. This is why Craig wanted six counties and not nine. That would leave him with a one third hostile minority. More of a challenge in Belfast and indeed in the border counties. Um, um, Joe Devlin, the nationalist leader, was not consulted at all, and he could write to his friend, the future Cardinal O'Donnell, uh, in um, February 1920, 
Um, as far as I can see the situation, it means a parliament will be set up in the north of Ireland. There's that old phrase again that Ian Paisley used in the 60s, as we have in Monte, not for the whole of Ulster, but for the six counties. This will mean the worst form of partition and, of course, permanent partition. So Devlin is aware of the realities of this. Craig gets his way. The government eventually insists on six counties. They have to get their unionist friends on board. This government, uh, which is too co-prime ministers, Lord George, the renegade liberal whose party was now deeply divided, and Bona Law, the uh, Tory leader of Ulster Stock, the next slide please. And here we have of course Craig takes other steps. He argued powerfully in cabinet for the creation of an exclusively Protestant police force to create the new entity of Northern Ireland. This would be based on the pre-war UVF returning from the trenches, reinforced by young men from factory and farm. Um, and of course, it was recruited in Orange Lodges uh, during this period. Um, it was it was camouflaged at Westminster because the Labour Party and the, the rump of the Asquith Liberals were in uh, on a war footing against uh, the government's policy. And it, it, these, these, the new force was described as special constables for Ireland but they were ready for the six counties. And while um, some genuflection was given to, they would include, um, if you like, uh, responsible citizens from all communities. Privately, Craig was able to assure uh, his entourage, people like Colonel Spender, that only Protestants need apply to join the specials. So this becomes a really important force. It's armed, it's paid for by Westminster. And of course, uh, it's massed on the border by 1922. 32,000 strong at its height. A specials part time, full time, uh, a large number of B specials, something like 18,000, and then a non ped reserve who really swept in everybody else. To nationalists, of course, these farmhands and uh, um, manual workers were the dregs of the Orange Lodges and they certainly were not popular. One British official said they were regarded by Catholics in the same spirit that the Black and Tans were regarded in the South. But without them, the state could not have been established. The next slide, please. And of course, here we have Lloyd George. Notice there's some confusion in 1920 as to the size of Northern Ireland. In this slide, it's Ulster. The Council of Ireland, um, the cartoonist is saying, is meant to bring the two parts of Ireland together. But is that really going to happen, given the history and the bitterness? Next slide, please. And of course, um, Craig does something else. He insists that uh, a new undersecretary is appointed for Ireland, not in Dublin for the first time, but in Belfast. Sir Ernest Clark, a Conservative man, he uh, is the midwife of the new Northern Ireland state. He sets in train um, uh, the uh, essential, uh, if you like, machinery for a new judiciary, a new civil service. And again, um, it's largely the case of no Catholic need apply. We have the famous one or two uh, senior civil servants who were Catholics are brought from Dublin. But in the case of one man, a man called uh, Dr. Boland, who was recommended by the Treasury in London, um, Clark writes back to the Treasury, oh yes, Mr. Boland, he was interviewed last week by Sir James Craig. This is May 1921. And the attitude of the Unionist government is thanks, but no thanks. I think you know why. Boland was an Irish Catholic. He was not acceptable to serve the new government. And so this leads inevitably to um, uh, elections held north and south amidst continuing violence in um, the spring of 1921. Craig, of course, called on the Union Jack to sweep the polls. He wins 40 of the 52 seats in the new Northern Ireland Parliament. Devlin had demanded um, a weighted presence in the House of, in, in, the, in, the, in the Senate, which would give the nationalists a say in the shaping of legislation. All of that's rejected. But Carson obtained a concession in the South for the Southern Unionists, 10% of the population, that they would actually have half the members of the Dublin Senate. And that was honoured by Arthur Griffith as part of the Irish Free State. And the first chairman of the Irish Senate in Dublin was Lord Glenavy. Um, a uh, former Carsonite MP. So, I mean, very different attitudes to minorities north and south. You can see that there. Um, it was arranged, of course, that elections would be held in the south. That was a Sinn Féin landslide and a reaffirmation of the Republic. So the south was now in turmoil. The violence was continuing. Uh, when the king, 
uh, was sent to Belfast to open the new Northern Ireland Parliament instead. Of course, the king wanted to end the violence in Ireland. He didn't just want to make any old speech. He was concerned about the risk of civil war. He was heavily influenced by General Smuts, the South African uh, Prime Minister, who had once been a rebel against the Crown uh, as one of the Dutch Boers in the Boer War. Smuts was in touch with de Valera, a president on the run, recently returned from his campaign in America, and uh, he helped to write the King's Speech. And in the City Hall, to an exclusively Unionist and Protestant audience, the Nationalists, of course, uh, six Nationalists, six um, Sinn Féin, had formed a pact. They abstained from the new parliament, saying partition means national suicide. Nonetheless, the king called on Irish men to forgive and forget, to stretch out the hand of forbearance. And this opened up the possibility of a truce in the war that was, you know, eating into the British soul. The Church of England bishops had condemned it. The king had condemned reprisals. Uh, the liberal press were up in arms. The Labour Party sent a commission to Ireland. Things were being done in Ireland that were really shaming many people in Britain. Uh, and in the end, of course, the King's speech was heard by de Valera in the south. Within days, a truce was arranged, applying to the whole island. The next slide, please. And of course, that truce would result in, uh, as the King's Honour Guard left Belfast, it was um, attacked in South Armagh by the IRA, a number of soldiers and a large number of horses, which had fought in the Western Front, I suppose, were killed as well in South Armagh. And this was a reminder that this issue of partition was not going to be buried very easily in the tumultuous years to come. The next slide, please. And of course, this would lead inevitably to uh, Lord George, shaky coalition. He opens negotiations. De Valera refuses to go, fearing perhaps disaster. He sends Griffith and Collins. They negotiate from October to December 1921. Lord George, there are three issues in the negotiations. There is the status of the Irish state. Will it be a republic or not? There is British security. Will they have bases in Ireland? There is partition. Will partition remain? Will it be softened? Will there be a united Ireland? No one knows. The next slide, please. De Valera is still sitting at home as president of the Republic. The next slide, please. And of course, the negotiations go on. By October, they've reached crisis point. Sinn Féin are demanding um, essential unity of Ireland. And they're playing a lot on Fermanagh and Tyrone, two counties with small nationalist majorities and nationalist councils. Lord George passes a note to his civil servant. This is going to wreck the settlement. Craig is summoned to London. You'll have to accept a federal Ireland. Craig seems to agree and then he comes back stiffened by his cabinet and says, no way. Uh, an All-Ireland Parliament is off the agenda. Lord George then persuades Sinn Féin to accept the Boundary Commission, a half-baked idea, no plebiscite. In the end, a treaty is signed, um, which creates an Irish free state, including the whole of Ireland, but the North can opt out after one year, in which case a commission of free men will redraw the border. That raises nationalist hopes west of the ban in Fermanagh, Tyrone, people like Cahirhealy, the Murnahans, Unionist fears. Craig fears that he's going to lose part of his territory. What we have, we hold is his slogan. In the end, by 1925, after war and civil war, the Boundary Commission collapses and uh, a bitterly divided Ireland with a hard border emerges with a civil war dividing opinion in the South and taking the life of Michael Collins and a near civil war in the North, have, leaving a sullen, resentful minority under Unionist rule in Belfast. Thank you very much.